Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Virginia Summy, and I am the author of The Life of Elrita Melton Alexander, Activism Within the Courts, uh, published by the University of Georgia Press. And so today I'm just going to go over um, a little PowerPoint presentation about um, an overview of the book and Judge Alexander's life. Uh, so Judge Alexander, um, she was born Elrita Narcissus Melton in March of 1919 in Smithfield, North Carolina, which is about 30 minutes southeast of Raleigh. Uh, her father was a Baptist minister, and so they moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, when she was about 12 years old. Uh, from there, she attended uh, Dudley High School which was the all-Black high school in East Greensboro. Uh, she graduated at um, the age of 15. Uh, her mother, who was a primary school teacher, had started her in the, the first grade early. So she graduated from high school at 15 and then um, stayed at home and went to North Carolina A&T uh, University, which was just a few blocks uh, from the house that she grew up in. Um, and there she graduated um, at the age of 18. Uh, this is a picture of her family uh, taken about the time when they moved to Greensboro. So she is about 12 years old um, in that picture. Um, she was the youngest. Uh, she had an older brother named Judson and an older sister named Etta. Uh, so she was uh, very much a, a daddy's girl. Uh, she was definitely uh, the baby of the family. Uh, this is a picture of one of her classes at Dudley High School. Um, I'm not exactly sure the year of this picture, but you can see her right here in, in the front row right there. Uh, while she was at North Carolina A&T, she met her future husband, uh, Tony Alexander. Um, right after uh, graduation, uh, she became what um, many of uh, many young women who were a part of the Black middle class were expected to do, and she became a teacher. Uh, she eventually eloped in 1938 with uh, Tony, and she was teaching in South Carolina, and according to the law of South Carolina, a married woman was not allowed to teach. And so uh, she came back home. She worked at the library at North Carolina A&T, and the, she also uh, volunteered uh, for some city council races. And there she developed an interest in politics. And the city councilman or the proposed city councilman who she was working for lost the race and but decided that you know, she would make a very good attorney. Uh, they initially laughed off the suggestion and her father suggested that she go to grad school to get her master's in teaching. Um, but at this point already her marriage was quite troubled. Uh, Tony had gone to Meharry Medical School in Nashville, Tennessee which at the time was the only medical school for African-American students in the South. And he came back to Greensboro and was a surgeon at L. Richardson Hospital, which was the segregated hospital uh, in East Greensboro. And so he was making a decent amount of money. His mother uh, lived in New York. And so when uh, Elrita suggested going to law school, he said, well, do what you want, but go to New York and live with my mother. So in her words, uh, she said, that bastard, I'm going to make him pay. And so she applied to the most expensive schools in New York and ended up being the first African-American woman admitted to Columbia Law School. So she arrives in uh, New York in 1942 at the cusp of, at the beginning or you know, in World War II. And this was a particularly fortuitous time for women to go to grad school because of the lack of men who were um, overseas serving. And so uh, this was a time when um, law schools, not just Columbia, but other law schools like Harvard, Duke, were also admitting more women. 
And Columbia had an accelerated program where you go, go through the summer. The program was initially designed to get men through the program quickly so they could serve, um, but Elrita was able to take advantage of that and finished her law degree in, um, in two years or in two years. And so when she arrived at Columbia, the dean of the law school said, uh, you know, Miss Alexander, we're, we're excited that you're here. You were the first woman of your race that we have ever accepted. So your performance depends upon whether or not we will admit more. And she said that she was so distracted that she could not hear the lessons for the first six weeks of class. Um, ultimately, uh, she did very well because uh, the second African-American woman that Columbia Law School admitted was Constance Baker Motley, uh, who then became the second um, Black woman to graduate from Columbia Law. Um, afterwards, she uh, worked in Harlem for a little bit while she regained her residency in the state of North Carolina so she could apply to sit for the bar in North Carolina. Of course, being in the South, North Carolina had laws that were designed to keep African Americans from uh, from sitting from for the bar. One of those was that they had to be deemed exceptional and meritorious. So she had to receive legal legal affidavits just to be able to sit for the bar in North Carolina. Um, after a couple of personal setbacks, uh, she was able to uh, sit for the bar and passed. Um, making her the first Black woman in the state of North Carolina to practice law. She was actually the second to pass the bar, um, but the first to actually um, gain her license in, in North Carolina. These are a couple of pictures that are not in the book um, because we could not get a high enough resolution uh, for them to be published. Um, but in 1951, she gave birth to her first child, uh, Gerardo Alexander III, um, and that is a picture um, of them. And the other is a picture of uh, her and her husband, Tony. Um, I write about the marriage in, in the book. It was a very tumultuous marriage. Uh, Tony struggled uh, with uh, mental illness and alcoholism and was very uh, physically and emotionally and um, verbally abusive to uh, Elrita and, and their son. Um, their son uh, himself, he was an only child, had um, a sad story in and of itself. Um, as a teenager, he was uh, diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and uh, struggled uh, struggled throughout uh, his life. Um, before she became a judge, while she was uh, practicing law in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, she came back to her to her hometown. Uh, one of the most significant uh, trials that uh, she was the defense attorney to for uh, was an interracial rape case that happened in Guilford County in 1964. Um, basically, uh, four young Black men were accused uh, and um, ultimately convicted of um, raping a white woman outside of Jamestown, North Carolina. And at the time, it was the longest criminal trial in Guilford County, North Carolina history. Guilford County is where uh, Greensboro is. Um, but Having been an attorney in North Carolina for uh, several years at this point, she noticed that she had tried very few cases that had any Black jurors. And so um, part of her defense rested on being able to get um, Black jurors in, um, in the courtroom. And so she uncovered the race-based system of uh, jury selection that was happening in North Carolina, particularly in Guilford County, which was very convoluted. Um, but the, she was able to get one single Black juror on the case. And of course, in 1964, an interracial rape case was a death penalty case. The four men were ultimately found guilty, um, but when they polled the jury, 
the, the one um, black man who they were able to get on the jury um, burst into tears and said, guilty, but I want to recommend mercy, um, which spared them um, from the death penalty. Uh, there were several other issues in the, uh, in the, uh, during the trial, um, as far as potential jury tampering, um, but ultimately the the state the the trial went to uh, the Supreme Court of North Carolina, where it ultimately stood. Uh, that case inspired her to become uh, to run for district court judge, where in 1968 she became the uh, first black woman in the United States to become an elected district court judge, a position she held until 1981. And then in 1974, she ran for North Carolina Supreme Court Chief Justice um, under the Republican uh, Party. She had um, remained a Republican through this time. Um, uh, she lost in the Republican primary to a white fire extinguisher salesman with no college degree, um, which uh, made a lot of waves in North Carolina. Um, that ultimately led to, in 1980, an amendment to the North Carolina Constitution uh, was added saying that anybody who held a judgeship had to have a law degree. Um, that was the case that tried, that, uh, Campaign was also notable for uh, Associate Justice Susie Sharp One becoming the first woman in the country to be an elected Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court. Um, her first marriage um, ultimately ended in divorce in 1968. In 1979, she remarried. Um, her sadly, her son. Um, was convicted of um, murdering his uh, caretaker in the early 1990s. Um, and then she died in March of 1998, just short of her 70th birthday. And I like this uh, quote by former Governor Jim Holshauser of North Carolina. Um, As the drama is unfolding, you don't get the big picture. But when you look back at the end of the day, hers was a remarkable journey. And so that is a brief story, a brief overview of the life of Elrita Alexander. Um, and again, I hope you uh, enjoy uh, enjoy the book.
Greetings, and thank you for your interest in my book, which is about an Afro-Caribbean in the Nazi era. The Afro-Caribbean is the gentleman in this picture. His name was Lionel Romney, and he was my father. My name is Mary Romney. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking about where and when my father lived. And then I'll outline my father's World War II experience, followed by some brief background on the Nazi era and Mauthausen, which was the concentration camp where he was imprisoned. And then in his own words, you will hear him talking about his experience at Mauthausen. I'll say a word about his survival. I'll discuss trauma and healing. And I will conclude with why I wrote my book about my father's wartime experience. So again, this was my father's name, Lionel Romney. This is when he lived and his life in geographical terms. Rather than explain it in detail, I'll just say that number one is meant to represent the Dutch side of the Caribbean island of St. Martin, which is where my father was from. And number two is meant to represent Aruba, Curaçao, and Venezuela, which are three more places where my father lived in his pre-war life. Now I'm going to outline his World War II experience as he told it to me in his oral history. The oral history that I recorded with my father was the source of the information in my book. As a civilian, he was a sailor on cargo ships sailing between the Caribbean, North America, and Europe from the mid-1930s to 1940. And in June 1940, he was aboard the SS Machis, which was a Greek merchant ship sailing through the Mediterranean on its way to Greece. The ship was mined, as you know, a mine is an explosive device, and it sank, but the crew was rescued by the Italian Navy. They were somewhere in these waters when the Italian Navy rescued them. So that was how my father became a political prisoner in Italy. And for the next four years, he was transferred through a series of internment camps in Italy until 1944, when he was deported from this area of Italy to the Mauthausen concentration camp in Austria, which is approximately there. And he was a prisoner there until the camp was liberated by the US Army at the end of the war. Being taken to Mauthausen put him squarely in the hands of the Nazis, so I'd like to say a word about Mauthausen within the context of the concentration camp system. As you know, there were different kinds of concentration camps. There were death camps, also known as extermination camps. There were labor camps. There were prison camps. There were women's camps. There were transit camps. However, Mauthausen was the only camp that was specifically designated to work its prisoners to death. It was the only so-called death through work camp. About 200,000 people were imprisoned there over the life of the camp. And these included people from all the groups that the Nazis specifically targeted for extermination. And those were Jews, Roma and Sinti, Slavic peoples, the handicapped, criminals, Jehovah's Witnesses, communists, political opponents, and LGBTQ. So the prisoner population there was very diverse. And every country in Europe was represented, as well as every continent. About 90,000 people were worked to death, tortured to death, starved to death, and died in other ways at Mauthausen. My father witnessed the destruction of human life every day that he was at Mauthausen, which was almost a year. He was always wondering if he would be next. The result was that he was deeply traumatized by his experience there, so much so that he was virtually silent about it for over 40 years. But finally, in 1989, he opened up and began to talk about it. I never thought he would because it had taken me over 20 years to get him to talk about it. So I wanna play a few minutes 
of our very first conversation about his internment at Mauthausen. This is from the first oral history interview we had together. This excerpt is a, is a little bit less than three minutes. And um, so then after the war, where, where were you when the war ended? I was in, uh, I was in a camp, a camp in Austria. In Austria, not in Germany. No, in Germany, in Austria. In we Austria. came in from, from Italy, they took us to Austria. By yeah. train. Yeah, a cattle car, a cattle, uh, what the hell you call it? Uh, a cattle car? Yeah, a cattle car. Yeah. A river, what a bundle in there. And where in Austria? It was up in the place, it's near to Graz, but in a, a concentration camp, one of those notorious concentration camps, where Mount Dawson is up on a hill. They had the crematorium and the, and the, what, the, the camps, you know. The barracks like thing, you know, so many people in the, in the barracks. So we, we were liberated in 1945, the 10th of May. 10th of May? 1945. About a couple of days after, before Hitler died. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Huh, that's interesting. We, we, were, we were liberated by the, uh, the Fifth Army, the American Fifth Army. A couple of days after what? A couple of days before Hitler died. You ever, did you ever have any close calls? Did you, were you ever in, what kind of danger would you say you were in during that time? Oh, it was, it was, every day was dangerous. It wasn't a day that was on the uh, night. Sometimes sometime you said, uh, so how the hell are you going to get out of here? And then we had, we had so many, you know, different things from the atrocities of the Germans was uh, committing in the camps, like before they leave, they kill everybody. Right. See if they have to run away. But we were up, we were up close to the place in Austria where we were. It was close to uh, the, the just looking back in the water. Uh -huh. You can hear the, the Russian cannonading, uh, and you can hear the concussion from the. the, the the artillery, you know? Oh, yeah. But how did you survive? This was one of the first questions I asked my father when he talked about his experience. He never answered that question, but I know that there were a few reasons why he survived. Perhaps the main reason for his survival was his knowledge of languages. Prisoners with language skills were often allowed to live longer than others because they could serve as interpreters. So my father knew these languages. Papiamentu is a Caribbean language, but all the others are European languages. And there were lots of prisoners at Mauthausen who spoke all of these European languages. So he was able to communicate with a lot of people. One of his nicknames was the translator. The subtitle of my book is From Papiamentu to German. And that is meant to pay tribute to the role of languages in my father's survival. Even though he survived, my father was deeply traumatized. However, oral history may have played a part in helping him to heal. So I'd like to read a passage from my book that addresses the healing power of speaking about trauma. In the absence of words, the survivor perpetually endures past trauma as present experience but words allow him to relegate the past to its proper place. Words bring him to a safe space. And I think that's what happened to my father during our oral history interviews. Now, in the same way that oral history was healing for my father, my experience visiting Mauthausen in 2006 and then writing the book brought peace to me. So again, reading from my book, visiting Mauthausen, finally brought me to a place of peace with my father's experience there. Although he was a victim of the Nazis, he was also a victor. His victory was in his survival. Knowing this, I can gratefully be at peace. 
I wrote this book about my father's experience for a few reasons. Among them are that I wanted to weave another thread into the tapestry of African diaspora history in order to help complete the picture because so much of it is missing. We as African diaspora people have to take control of and responsibility for our own narrative. It is because others have appropriated our narrative for so many centuries that we have not been in control of it. And oral history helps us take that control. Also, I wanted my book to be an example of how everyone has participated in or been a witness to historical events. And I wanted my book to serve as an example to others and encourage them to pursue oral histories with their families. In closing, I would just like to say that my father's oral history is the basis of my book about his World War II experience and my visits to Mauthausen. My father's experience is an example of a story that only came to light because of oral history. I hope that my experience with oral history will encourage you and others to embark on oral history projects with your families and members of your communities. Thank you very much.
All right, my name is Tony Warner. I'm from London. I run a group called Black History Walks. We've been going since 2007. And what we do is we organize walks, talks, and films on the Black history of London every single month, all year long for the last 15 years. So we have about 15 different walks in North, East, South, West London. They last about two hours long. Um, and apart from doing the walking, we also have a, a Black History River cruise on the River Thames. And this goes from Embankment to Greenwich and back. It lasts about three hours long. And on that cruise, we show people all the African Caribbean history that's actually in the river itself on either side of the river. Um, and we also have actors on board the boat who tell the stories of real historical characters. So we have people like Queen Nanny the Maroons. We have Warrior Queen Yara Santua. We have Queen Amani Rinas. They're actually in costume on board the boat who tell their stories while we go up and down. And apart from the river cruise, we also have a Black History bus tour, another three hour journey, which is a bus which goes all across London, um, central London, that we show people the African Caribbean history in North, East, South, West London on a, from a bus perspective. So we have the walks, we have the bus tour, river cruise, then we have films. So we show films once a month, all year long for the last 15 years. Um, and the films come from the African diaspora, so they could come from Cuba or Venezuela or the Philippines. Any place where we have black people, we show films. Um, and the films that we show are the films that are not normally shown in mainstream cinemas. Plus, we have a QA. and a So it's walks for walks, talks, and films. And the talks are on any topic that we can, you know, find out about or come across. So we have a variety of different talks on different subjects from World War I, World War II, religion, spirituality, um, healthcare, et cetera. So all, those, all of those things you're going to find in the book as well. And I should mention, apart from doing walks, talks, and films, we also put up historic blue plaques to famous people in this country. So in America, I'm not sure if you have the same sort of set, but in the UK, there's um, these plaques, blue plaques outside of people's houses, which tell the story of the person who lived there if they were of particular interest. Um, but as you can imagine, there's a massive lack of black people when it comes to these blue plaques. So we organize fundraisers and research to put up plaques in honor of black people across the country. And we've done about well, 10 so far, um, and we have about five more to do. So that's the sort of thing that we do in the UK. Oh, I should also mention that um, apart from Black History Walks and London Volume 1, which is my own book, and we worked on a book for a school. So we have GCSE, which is a kind of um, high school kind of um, certificate you get here. And we just wrote a book based on our Notting Hill Walk. So we took the information from our Notting Hill Walk, made it into a school book. And this school book is now being studied in schools across the country. Um, so they learn about black history for the first time ever in schools at GCSE level. Um, and that's a big deal. So I'm in that book or wrote that book, co-wrote that book, I should say. And also my own book, personal book is called Black History Was Number One Worm. Now in the book, we took about two and a half of our walks and made it into one book. The book's about 90,000 words. Um, I think it's about 450 pages and it covers a vast variety of topics. So it's talking about ancient Africa, it's talking about the World Bank, the IMF, it's talking about religion, politics, Black British rights. So we have a, the biggest chapter in the book is all about Black British civil rights. And that's because if you go to school here, we are taught about Luther King in America, Malcolm X in America, and Rosa Parks in America. But we're not talking about what happened in this country when it came to the fight for equality right here because there was a massive fight going back hundreds of years when it came to equality um, in employment, education, housing, healthcare. So one thing that we've done, or I've done, I should say already, is that in the book, we have like a comparative timeline. So we look at significant points in US black history, um, going, to, going back to 1945 and World War II, and we take up to the 2000s, and we look at what happened in America compared to what happened over here. So we show the kind of, progression and comparisons of the fight for equality in this country when it came to things like the Sus law. So for example, if I just mentioned briefly the Sus law, in the UK up, to, up until the mid eighties, we had a law called the Sus law, which meant that a police officer, if he thought in his mind that you might commit a crime in the future, he could arrest you and charge you. So let me say that again slowly. If this guy, if, if an officer saw you up until the mid eighties and he thought that you might commit a crime in the future, 
he could arrest you, charge you, and at this time, the Dauphin beat you as well. So that was a major issue for the black community because a lot of young black men got arrested and charged and imprisoned for things they had never done. And I'll give an example in that it was so bad that you could be a, a black schoolboy in school uniform at a bus stop, wait for a bus to go home and be arrested under the SUS law. You could be arrested for being at a bus stop in uniform as a 12 year old child. So this only began to end when the black community organized something called the Scrap SUS campaign headed by one called Mavis Best. And Mavis Best and a group of black women from what we call an area called Lewisham lobbied, campaigned, argued, protested, and eventually got this SUS law repealed, overturned, and kicked out back in the mid 80s. So much as you might know about police misbehave in America, we had some major issues here that we actually had a whole law that allowed police officers to do what they want. Um, and that's still an issue even now. But that's one aspect we look at in the book when it comes to um, the fight for equality. I mean, if I speak about education briefly again, in this country, we had something called the ESN policy. That stands for Educationally Subnormal, ESN. And that means basically that if you were a black child in school here, up until around the 80s as well, you could be labeled as ESN, which means that you were stupid, backward, lazy, ignorant, primitive, and just had no sense. So official policy in this country until the 80s at least was that as a black child, you could be labeled as stupid and within the school system, they'd put you into a separate class altogether. Or sometimes you'd be in the same class as white kids sitting next to them, but you'd be getting a different type of education. So for example, they might give the white kids teaching in maths and English, but then they'd give you a football or some crayons to do a crayon uh, coloring, in, coloring in rather. So this sort of thing we had to deal with. And also, when it came to academic achievement, you found that kids at school, 12, 15, 16, et cetera, when they were thinking of um, um, leaving school and going for jobs, you would have something called a careers advisor who'd work with the school or in the school. And if, as a black child, you went to them, they would tell you, you could be, if you try really hard, you could maybe stack shelves in Walgreens or whatever. They could maybe stack shelves at a supermarket, or maybe you could street the street. So, and this is literally what people were told. Black kids were told that they could they could aspire to be a street sweeper. This is in this country, England, up to at least the 80s. So there was a huge movement against that as well. So different groups of black people across the country fought against the ESM policy and eventually got it kind of um, kicked out and changed, but it took a, a massive amount of time, effort and resources and commitment for that to happen. But again, if you are in this country, we get taught about what happened in America. So for example, we get taught here about the March on Washington in America in 63. We get taught, it's literally part of our curriculum. So if you go to school, uh, primary school or secondary school, you'll be taught in England about the March on Washington in America in 63. However, in London, England in 81, 81 we had a march of about 20,000 mostly black people. For 11 miles, they marched from uh, New Cross to Central London, about 11 miles of distance, right? And this march was called the Black People's Day of Action. And this march is all about the fight for equality, equal treatment in this country, in particular is about people dying because of racism. Because the trigger for the Black People's Day of Action in 81, this massive march which took place in London, was the fact that there'd been a suspected racist arson attack at a house in New Cross full of young black kids. Long story short, 13 black kids got burned to death, died because of a suspected racist arson attack. And I should also mention that at this time in the 80s, arson attacks were very common on black homes. You'd have firebombs, you'd have bricks through the windows, you'd have people being beaten up or killed in the street by racist white people. And that was quote unquote normal at the time. So this fire took place um, in January 81, and the police said they couldn't find people responsible. They tried to blame the victims. And again, long story short, there was a massive protest by the black community against this racist behavior. So this march took place in 81, about, and they marched from, as I said before, from Lewisham to Central London. And in effect, this is basically a, a, a human rights, civil rights protest march. But the, the comparison is that, this march that took place here in anyone is not taught in schools here. So the march is all about 
Black Who Ban Because of Racism is about an anti-racist march. It protests against um, police behavior, immigration laws, um, racism in education. It was about all those racial issues which took place here. Um, and that march is the biggest ever march of Black people in the UK, and it's all about the fight for equality in this country. But it might surprise you to know that that march, which took place in this country, anyone, is not taught in schools. It's not on the curriculum. So we in England get taught about the American fight for equality, the big march you had in America in Washington, uh, D.C. in 63 with Luther King. But the march that took place in London in 81, 81, to do with the fight for racial equality here is not taught in schools, even by way of comparison. So if you get my book, Black History Watson London Volume 1, which is also available um, on Amazon, also there's an audible version, there's an audio version that you can listen to, you're going to read about all these issues. So it covers, as I said before, World War II, World War I, housing, education, employment, Black race civil rights, um, the World Bank, the fight for clean water, Paul Robeson's in there, Du Bois, du Bois is in there, um, there's a lot of African-Americans over here in the UK, which helped in the whole kind of international fight against racism. So it's a unique book, it's pioneering, it's not been done before. And it's a really good way to find out a bit about the history you'll never be told by those regular mainstream tour guides who give you the typical walks you, you see, or typical tours you see when you come to London. So if you're interested in finding out some black history from a British, British perspective, especially a kind of a behind the scenes black perspective on London, get Black History Walks in London Volume 1, out now from Jack around the books. And one more thing I should mention, my publishing company is a black owned female company and they pioneered this book, which would never happen but for them. So they're called Jack around the book, Jack around the books rather, black owned, black female um, directed, et cetera. And if you buy from them, their money goes to producing even more black British authors. Thank you. Oh, I should mention my website actually. Website is Black History Wars co.uk so it's black at uk and thank you for listening
thank you for having me at the association. Um, I'm excited to be here. First, I have to thank Marisa Royval. Uh, she is why I am here. And uh, first things first, Blackton was a real place. There are people who believe that I made it up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, one of them is uh, Dr. Kenneth Hamilton. Well, he doesn't think I made it up. He just um, uh, looks at the new ways of doing history and we've had some discussion. So what I'm giving you is a discussion that I begin with in uh, the book that I'm describing that I'll show you later. So who am I? What is my credibility? So let's start here. This is the Afro frontier thesis. Okay. This is brand new. This is new black history. Okay. Now, <laughs> Take a minute uh, to take out your phones or get another screen ready because this is going to go by really quickly. Um, I'm going to have you Google things just so that you can keep up with me. Uh, this is about 45 uh, different slides or different movements, and it will allow you to go with the flow. Now, I am a D student, okay? So I'm still going to change your life, but I'm a D student, and I put the D in a dd because back then they didn't have the 80 hd so okay i'm i'm done with my dad jokes okay all right so what am i talking about i went to compton community college okay i also went to compton high school so i'm from compton okay now <clears throat> and i talk about black right have you ever heard of black people on horses in compton so much so that there's a sign that says, don't ride your horse on my lawn, right? So it, you, you would have a question if you went to Compton because, you know, you know, straight out of Compton, straight out of Compton, you, that kind of thing is uh, not very well understood, right? And you can see that in how in the summer of 2020 uh, began with racial violence, similar to the assaults perpetuated during the summer of 1919, a period often referred to as Red Summer. Black people on horseback, born and raised in Compton, was a vivid show of anti-racist force. June 9, 2020, Black cowboys and cowgirls from Compton graced the pages of the New York Times. Under the headline, Evoking History, Black cowboys take to the streets. What history, though? For us, the people who grew up in Hub City, it was more of our reality. Now, let me show you something. Okay, I like you to, I want you to indulge in these, in the evidence that I'm bringing you today. Uh, Main Street Compton looks like that, like a cowboy town. Now, if you look at the bottom picture, you'll see that those are the Compton cowboys and cowgirls out in the BLM riot. protest they were there as a force an anti-racist force now this is my contribution to black history so i'm putting it up front even though it is the end of the project so i'm going to do the beginning and then we're going to do the second beginning blackton's third decade is um during the roaring 20s and the harlem renaissance so go ahead and google Wik, you know, or use Wikipedia and find the Blackdom New Mexico narrative, okay? Because what I'm going to do is give you something that uh, nowhere can you find this but with me. What you see here is Black people in 1919 organizing an oil company in, quote, the Wild West. We'll pull acreage. Roswell Daily Record, December 31st, 1919. So I'm talking about boom times, but you can't find that anywhere else, which means this is new Black history. So most of the rest of the time, I'm just going to be correcting the record, but realize the book that I'm, that I'm presenting to you is new Black history that you can't find anywhere else. All right, so in 1920, Blackdom was a real place. Ruth Lumiskeen, a woman who passed as white uh, in the borderlands, Skeen wrote to W.E.B. Du Bois, 
in New York during the Harlem Renaissance and Roaring Twenties about Blackdom and reported uh, what she had uncovered. Now, I can go into it. Uh, I'll just show you the evidence because, again, this is 15 minutes, but you could see right there. Boom. Pause right there. And then uh, use your Google machine. Okay. Second, you'll have in the spring of 1920, Black Demites officially platted their town. Okay. And they were also advertising will drill at Blackdom. What were they drilling for? And in the fall of 1920, this is the Roaring Twenties, right? In America, right? Uh, the Roswell Daily Record reported Blackdom location made. This is what I say. This is what I say when I say uh, Blackdomites struck oil. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but I do not want to. Uh, go into the complicated parts because that's why you know you need the book okay so when you look at the wikipedia or smithsonian who was also wrong state of new mexico who was also wrong they talk about the decline of blackdom happening after 1916 because of a drought and yada 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 well what you see here with the bureau of land management is the heron family still homesteading in 1921 and we can talk about that if we get a question and answer period now this is the part that usually confuses a lot of people because black people did sell their church in the summer of 1922 but if you look at that through the lens of well white people that makes sense right then nothing else is going on but through the lens of black folks behind the du boisian veil of double consciousness they had something else going on what was that something else? Americanism. These were people who uh, understood the rise of the second wave of the Ku Klux Klan, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, and its limited abilities in New Mexico. Okay, we can talk about how complicated it is there because we're talking about a territory that became a state and very complicated. But Americanism had poisoned the air, the water, and the social conscience over it, since, you know, D.W. Griffin's work and then moving after the post-World uh, War I. And now you have Black people doing well in Raswell. And so you have the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in New Mexico. So uh, how historic is this town, right? Okay, so let's put it like this. One of the Black Demites, Clinton Ragsdale, wrote to W.E.B. Du Bois five years after Ruth Loomis' scheme. And Du Bois wrote back to Clinton Ragsdale of Blackdom. Well, it says Dexter here, but we can go on about that too. See, so you see the Roaring Twenties, the Harlem Renaissance <laughs> is happening in the Wild West, quote, right? And I, okay. So here's the quick claim deed, 1926, of land being exchanged from Frank Boyer. That's the guy. That's the person that you will hear about in most of the stories as the Moses-like figure. And he did any quick deed, claim deed to uh, the Eubank family patriarch, uh, Crutcher Eubank. And he's a... Now, here's the key. Henry Boyer, this is his obituary. If you look everywhere else, it says he ne never made it to the promised land because they wanted to set up a whole different narrative trajectory. Here you can see he died uh, at his son's house in Roswell. Here's the Wikipedia article. You didn't really have to Google it. I have it here. You'll see that I'm not in any of the references here. Well, I just want you to notice that that's why you don't see this narrative anywhere about Black people striking oil during the Roaring Twenties and the Harlem Renaissance and participating in it. 1927, they participated in the uh, celebration of Juneteenth at Blackton. Okay, 1928, uh, they were still talking about oil and black and testing and going on and and the oil royalties uh continued into the world war ii era and today they are uh pumping that gas out there uh midi moore this is the person i haven't spoken about and if you're new to the black narrative this is one you will probably uh uh enjoy a bit uh she was a madam a bootlegger gunslinger 
Um, I can go on about it, but she was also a part of the Blackdom Oil Company and uh, Blackdom during the Roaring Twenties. So you have a bootlegger, black woman in the Wild West. We, we I don't have enough time. It's fifteen minutes, right? Okay, I have five minutes left. See, I only have five minutes left, so I can't go into it. All right, uh, colored folk. Now, what happened was people think that Blackdom disappeared. It didn't. They just melded into the uh urban areas kind of like they did with compton right compton and lone beach together now you know we're in trouble so what you see here is the compton and cowboys and cowgirls making money off of a brand that they're creating called compton cowboys right and you see them doing deals with lucky gene and ariat and what you're taught what i'm talking about here is the manifestation of afro frontierism it isn't it's a postscript to exoduster right exodusters they made it to the promised land well what do you do when you get there you got to create a brand and then you know partner up with lucky gene um i mean you know if you want to okay so that's uh the contribution of afro frontierism smashed together with uh, uh the blackdom micro history um now we're going to start at the beginning beginning where i normally start Okay, because we're talking about the borderlands and some things are not always linear. So I want to go back to where I should have started, where I normally would start. Uh, but I didn't know how the timing would come out. So uh, we're not going to read the land acknowledgement here, but I will acknowledge the land acknowledgement. And you can go to my website, afrofrontier.com, and then you can read it. Okay, and what I am talking about is the land acknowledgement to acknowledge the genocidal campaigns against the Mescalero Apache indigenous peoples. And that's the land that, where uh, Blackdom was. And here's a source I use, but I don't trust any sources that aren't indigenous. But here's one that talks about uh, military campaigns. You can usually uh, trust the locations at a minimum. Um, so here's Fort Sumner. And it is up the river okay i can show you the river but th that's the if you drove that is the blue part but on the right side you'll see the river uh the pecos river is important to this narrative because we're talking about the quote wild west and i'm um and so now at fort sumner what you see is uh uh it's on the other side of the pecos where jim crow is allowed so there was a understanding even though jim crow wasn't technically allowed in new mexico uh prior to 1912 and statehood it was an understanding where uh, uh um it was allowed and it's allowed on the uh, east side of the pecos and on the west side to allow black folks and so what you see like fort stanton over there where that uh black square is um that's where black troops were allowed the buffalo soldiers so now we're getting see how this is where we would begin if we talk about that okay so to speed up, I want to get to some evidence, and I can talk about the African diaspora and how it feeds in. What you, what, what I will start with is Bishop Richard Allen and uh, Prince Hall, Freemasonry and military. So what I, so what I begin with is the revolutionary triad of ministers, military personnel, and 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 uh, Freemasons, and so, and that includes uh, um, um, the auxiliary organizations. Okay, so the Negro Order of the Eastern Star, that kind of thing, all of it uh, uh, is included when I mention Freemasons. It's just one unit. Okay, at the core of this consciousness that I'm describing is Ethiopianism or a notion of sovereignty, okay, in the abstract and then it, in its manifestation. So I'll give you an example. In 1898, right after Plessy, Black folks decided they were going to be German in Pennsylvania and only speak German. I'll let you see. Uh, let me see if I can get that a little bit closer. Ah. I will move on. But if you pause your screen, you can read it there, whether they uh, they only want to speak German. Uh, so now we fast forward to El Paso, 1903. And I'm going to wrap it up now. And this is here where you end up with uh, Black Demites uh, capitalizing their, 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 their town site stock. Okay, so... This is where I'm supposed to end and I'm going to end, uh, but I want you to notice that my evidence comes directly from the person, Frank Boyer. This is where my story begins. 
Okay, I begin with Frank Boyer and what he said, and that's more important than what other people are saying. Here's the book, okay? And here is the article that I uh, help everybody to orient themselves to. And, and this is the last thing I'm gonna say and I'm done. Uh, Boyer is proud of the fact that relationship between the white and Negro residents of that section of Georgia always has been good. There has never been a lynching within the borders of the county, he says. That's Boyer. And the reason I'm saying that is because the myth often begins with Boyer running away from the Klan in Georgia, whatever. So I'm done with that. Any questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, ideas, feelings? Hello, everyone, and thank you to Asala for featuring my book, The Tuskegee Student Uprising, A History by NYU Press. My name is Brian Jones. I'm director of the Center for Educators and Schools at the New York Public Library, and really excited to have a few minutes here to talk with you about this book and, and how it emerged. Uh, my background is that I was, and, and the origin of this book, is that I worked for many years as an elementary school teacher in Harlem, in New York City, 
at a time when there was enormous debate about the future of Black education. And in particular, it seemed as if very wealthy and powerful people were determined to privatize the public schools that I was working in. That got me curious about the history of the relationship between philanthropists and Black educational topics. And of course, I found my way to James Anderson's book, Education of Blacks in the South. And that got me absolutely obsessed with Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama, and the history of Booker T. Washington and the school that he founded there in 1881. Well, it turns out that um, among the many different ways that scholars and historians have thought about the, the, the legacy of Booker T. Washington and the meaning of Tuskegee Institute, uh, sprinkled like breadcrumbs throughout the literature is a pattern of student protest that actually goes all the way back to the late 19th century. My dad went to Tuskegee, so he and I got to talking about this and we took a road trip in 2014. Neither of us had ever set foot in an archive but there we were in driving down to Tuskegee, Alabama to look through the papers in search of evidence of late 19th century, early 20th century student strikes actually. And we found that evidence, uh, but certainly not enough for the book uh, that I had in mind. Uh, but one of the archivists there helpfully suggested that if, if I was interested in uh, student protests, I should take a look at what happened there in the 1960s. Now, my dad graduated in 61. He, neither he nor I had any idea what had happened at Tuskegee Institute in the 1960s. But very well documented in the pages of the student newspaper, which is where we began, the Campus Digest, was an incredible story that just unfolded in the, as we turned the pages of that newspaper uh, of Tuskegee students stepping off campus in the 1960s to become involved in all phases of the Southern civil rights movement, the movement for voting rights and for democracy in the Black Belt. Um, they were connected to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee's campaigns in the surrounding Black Belt counties, for example, the founding of the Lowndes County Freedom Organization in Lowndes County, nearby Lowndes County, Alabama. Um, to, of course, Martin Luther King's campaigns, the Selma to Montgomery March, you name it, Tuskegee students were there. But then um, in the kind of tragic event that so often radicalizes Black freedom movements, one of their own was murdered, a Tuskegee student and Navy veteran, Sammy Young Jr., was murdered by a white gas station attendant in an off-campus incident involving a segregated bathroom, which posed questions more sharply to the students that they in turn took a harder look at the administration and at their school. They became the authors of some of the initial documents of what became known in those years as the Black University Movement, challenging their university to transform in various ways. And one of the ideas of my book is that the Tuskegee movement was so powerful and dynamic in part because of the way that it so skillfully fused together different impulses that the students had. Students at Tuskegee, which was in the middle of the 20th century, one of the most well-endowed HBCUs and with deep ties to the US military, uh, reserve officer training program, heavy recruitment by Fortune 500 companies and military industrial companies on the campus. Tuskegee was an, an opportunity to really accelerate uh, that undergraduate degree at Tuskegee could really accelerate somebody's uh, career. So the students felt in some ways that the school was not living up to that academic promise. And so some of their demands and campaigns and some of their protesting actually had to do with raising standards on the campus. And some of their protests had to do with the broader questions of, just, of justice that were ringing out throughout the region and the world in those years. It's no surprise to anybody to uh, learn that students, let alone Black students, were protesting in the 1960s. So 
But the way that these two different impulses were fused under the banner of Black power and a Black university meant that the Tuskegee student movement was uh, massive and powerful. And so when students decided in the days after the assassination of Dr. King in Memphis in April of 1968, when Tuskegee students decided to challenge the trustees directly um, at their semi-annual semi gathering on campus, they had hundreds of their classmates. They were able to shut down the school completely, surround the hall where the trustees were meeting, barricade themselves inside the building and effectively hold the process hostage while they presented their demands. Um, you know, this was an era when people on Black college campuses were um, facing very serious mortal threats from uh, agents of the state. In nearby South Carolina, they, students had been killed uh, in Orangeburg. Um, not that not that um, that far before the April of 1968 on Tuskegee's campus. So this was um, this was a perilous moment, and the students themselves were armed with nothing more than documents, and they presented those documents uh, to the trustees. And those documents lay out demands, uh, as I'm describing, uh, attempting to transform both teaching and learning, expand the curriculum, found. Uh, an Africana Studies department on the campus, um, provide scholarships for athletes, a whole range of, of demands that both reflect their desire to actually be even more successful um, and rise to the level of their academic uh, aspirations, their individual and career aspirations on the campus, and at the same time, uh, desires to have their school actually assist them in the process of preparing them to uh, make the world a better place and have something to do, make a contribution to the larger movements for justice and transform, global transformation uh, that were going on. And so um, they, they were, you know, in these dialogue with the trustees in April of 1968, when the Alabama National Guard came to the campus. Um, they were stalled by an administrator at the gates uh, for a time, but eventually they successfully cleared the campus. No one was injured, fortunately. But Tuskegee's administration shut down the school for two weeks and they dismissed every single student. They basically unregistered them and said, you are all no longer students of this school. Um, you all have to re-enroll in order to come back, um, which stalled, obviously, and kind of uh, thwarted the momentum of the movement up until that point. A federal judge intervened and reversed the decision and made, forced them to come back to campus. But the damage to the kind of movement momentum had been done by that point. But still, when the students returned to campus um, that semester and then in the next, in the fall semester of 1968, there were sweeping changes. They did win. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, the most impressive range of reforms on the campus um, that uh, that uh, su surpass any other uh, student movement on any other HBCU that I know of in those years. Um, they won wide ranging reforms, including the democratization of all committees that uh, address the student concerns with students being placed on those committees. Um, all instructors were mandated to provide syllabi for their course on the first day of each course. Um, all athletes became eligible for uh, full tuition, uh, full scholarship, tuition scholarships. Um, ROTC was made, uh, was no longer mandatory and was made um, voluntary and on and on and on, a sweeping transformation. And of course, the African Studies Department was founded uh, at that time and a dramatic expansion of just the course offerings that directly related to Black history and culture on the campus. So to me, part of what's, you know, th these similar events took place on other campuses. We know this. Uh, this is not uh, something new. Um, but to me, part of what's so powerful about this story is that it happened at Tuskegee, that at the place where 
after the overthrow of radical reconstruction, the deep pocketed elites, white people from the North, some of whom were very, uh, you might say, high minded or forward thinking, but had their own agenda for Black education in the South and sought to create a pattern, a structure for Black education that would allow Black or adjust Black people to the new social reality of Jim Crow in the US South. And I think what's so amazing about this history, which in the book I connect to those early, the late 19th century and early 20th century student protests, is the way in which students on the campus challenged that agenda from the very beginning. They pushed back on it in many different respects, but generally speaking along these two tracks, sometimes pushing for the schools to raise their, for the school to raise its standards and actually live up to their highest intellectual and academic dreams and aspirations, and other times challenging the ways in which they felt the school overly accommodated an unjust status quo in there. And, and the terms of the specifics of their demands and what they felt was unjust and needed to be challenged, of course, those things changed over time. But the general thrust was that the students were very active in that process, that Tuskegee, in other words, and the meaning of that place, I think, is not to be found just in the pronouncements or the speeches of Booker T. Washington. But it's important to see that uh, Tuskegee, really, like all schools everywhere, is a contested space where not just the leadership, but also, of course, the professors. And in my book, the focus is on the students who arrived with their own ideas and in various moments organized themselves to try to make those ideas a reality on that campus. And so the, the place that was seen as the template for Black education in the South um, is the very same place where we saw one of the most dynamic student movements in the 20th century. And that you know, reversal uh, I think is what this book is about. And um, I hope you read it and learn from it. And I look forward to hearing your questions and comments about it. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Ruben Britt, and I am the author of the book, Black and Powerful, The Career Guide for Tomorrow's Top Leaders. Black and Powerful is a career guide uh, for high school and college students. I was inspired to write this book because many of our underrepresented students are underserved when it comes to appropriate career guidance. The American, uh, American uh, Counseling Association recommends that the student to guidance counselor ratio uh, should be 250 to one, where while the national average is 450 to one. And in some cases, the average is 100, uh, 1100 to one ratio regarding students to guidance counselor. So as you can see, uh, this particular book would, is, is much needed in terms of supplementing the shortcomings of appropriate career guidance. Now, um, when we talk about this particular book, there are a number of different things that are covered in the book. Um, for instance, with regards to the high school uh, portion of the book, it basically uh, provides a step-by-step -step process based on each year. So it would tell students in high school what they should be doing if their freshman year, their sophomore year, their junior year and their senior year. And it's also separated by uh, students who are uh, interested in uh, going on to college as opposed to those who are, who are not uh, planning to go to college. But I, I can tell you this, is, it's, there's a heavy emphasis on students, whether they're, going, uh, whether they're college bound or non-college bound, the emphasis of having some type of skill or vocation. And so we talk, we talk about uh, those uh, with regards to those students who are not planning on going to college, that they need to, to come to uh, uh, have some type of vocation to be successful in their life, whether they want to be an auto mechanic, electrician, uh, fireman, or whatever it might be, um, it's important that they, they understand that. Also, um, I was truly uh, inspired to write this book because many of our uh, students are affected by dream killers, where you have guidance counselors who uh, will tell a student that they're not college material, or, or if they say that they're interested in going into computer science, they might say something like, well, you know, that's a tough major, and, um, and, and it can really shatter uh, a student's dreams and aspirations. Statistics show that uh, when these dream killers uh, shatter, uh, these, these students, many of them are traumatized and it affects their learning process as well as their IQ. Also, many of these students' parents have also been victim of, of, of uh, dream killers and traumatized as well. And so that's why uh, this particular book is very helpful. Um, the other thing is, is that each, each chapter is predicated with quotes by famous Black history makers from um, Martin Luther King to Mae Jameson uh, to Jesse Jackson to uh, legendary football coach Eddie Robinson. Speaking of Eddie Robinson, one, there is a chapter uh, for student athletes as well, which, which is called Don't Believe the Hype. And it basically talks about things that student athletes need to do because a lot of times coaches uh, are more, more uh, concerned about wins and getting their players out there on the field or the, or the court uh, to perform, but not looking, but, but not truly uh, interested in the welfare of, of, of their student athletes. And so I talk about those types of things. With regards to college students, I, I break it down in, by the four years, freshman, sophomore, uh, junior and senior year. And I talk about the, the importance of of career counseling and um, not getting caught up in just going to class every day. And that career planning is a lifelong process. And so that their, their career journey starts the day that they start school on, on the campus. And so we have, we have it broken down, as I mentioned before, by, by academic years, but we also talk about the importance of uh, participating in an internship. It allows you to, allow students to test the waters in terms of a uh, specific major that they may have selected, but it also uh, puts them in a better position 
when it's time for them to graduate because now they, they can walk out of college not only with a degree, but with hands, uh, with experience. Also, many of these um, uh, college uh, internship employers uh, generally will offer their, their, their former interns full-time employment when they graduate. The other thing is, is that with regards to the, the college students, we encourage them to participate in, in the um, career planning process. Um, as with uh, 38, over 38 years of experience in higher, higher education as a career coach and count, uh, career counselor, I know that college students are also uh, traumatized by, by dream killers as well. I, I am fortunate because I'm a person of color that I've been able to attract many students at the college that I work at because they see me, they see a person that looks like them when they walk in the door. I've also been able to connect with the, uh, the black fraternities and sororities to do presentations on career counseling, career planning, resume writing, interview techniques. And in this book, it has tips on how to conduct yourselves in an interview, how to dress for an interview, um, as well as um, professionalism in the workplace. The other thing is, is that we, we also have resources in the book in Black and Powerful, the Career Guide for Tomorrow's Top Leaders, resources regarding scholarships, um, fellowships that one can, can apply for, as well as information on how they can uh, um, apply for financial aid. And that's one of the areas that a lot of times parents get uh, intimidated at when it comes to uh, filling out financial aid forms and also where can they get assistance in terms of how to fill out a financial aid form. And so I provide information on that as well. Also, um, the book is a, a, is a, is a tool that, can, that parents can use to help guide their students uh, to supplement the shortcomings of, of uh, what guidance and school counselors uh, fail to provide for our students. Um, as I mentioned before, I have over 38 years in higher education. I have over 46 years of experience in education, both as a teacher and as a, a career, co career coach. And so I've, I've also worked, uh, worked as a consultant for the Depart US Department of Education, the New Jersey Department of Higher Education, as well as many other uh, colleges and organizations. Also, I am the author of four books. Um, and this particular one is uh, really dear to me because of my daily interaction with students, both at the high school level and at the college level. And I feel that it would be um, very helpful um, in terms of helping them chart out their career path. Also, I am the uh, host of Career Talk on WGLS FM, where I provide uh, information on career tips. And I also have guests who share information about their career journeys, as well as provide career tips to our listeners. And um, with regards to the many other um, experiences I've had, I've written a number of articles related to career development, education, and also social issues. Um, I am also uh, one who is easily accessible. The book is, as I said before, is, is a, a, a career guide that can help one uh, go from high school all the way into college or post-secondary education so that their career success will be a, a, a most uh, fruitful for them. Um, we don't want individuals, um, our young underrepresented students graduating from high school or college uh, uh, where they 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 have they're lost in terms of what's next. Um, we also uh, one of the chapters in the book is called networking, and we talk about uh, different steps on one uh, can do to network with people. And as we as we know, seventy percent of the jobs in this country are obtained through the network system by somebody knowing somebody by somebody knowing somebody who knows somebody. So it, it is uh, in this book, uh, as I said before, we cover the whole gamut from, from, um, uh, from job search information. We have resources on where to search for jobs. Um, and it doesn't include uh, Monster, Career Builder, or, or Craigslist. These are uh, uh, reputable job search engines where one can find jobs. 
Also, I was a uh, contributor to a book called The Last Job Search Book That You'll Ever Need, where I contribute three, uh, two chapters. One was about uh, creating a portfolio and the other one was about networking. And so when you, when you take a look at this particular book, along with uh, reading the, the various uh, inspirational quotes by famous uh, black history makers, it, it, would, it, it, it can inspire our young individuals to, uh, to, to begin to start charting out a career path and realize that there are possibilities, no matter what particular field that they, they decide to, to uh, go in, um, but it, it's a it's a way for them to see that things there are a number there's anything that's possible for them. Uh, with regards to um, my time as a school teacher, I'm a former school school teacher in the Boston Public School System, uh, where I taught uh, health phys ed as well as um, um, civics, and I coached uh, basketball, track, and cross country. And so I have I, I have that connection when it's when I when I talk about the student athlete in the book, and I spent many hours with my student athletes while when they were being recruited by college coaches to make sure that they weren't being exploited. Uh, with regards to uh, my my 38 years in higher education, I've uh, I uh, was also a former director of the cooperative education um, program at Bloomsburg University, a program which I started from scratch, from the ground on up. And then I also worked as the, the uh, coordinator of career services at Richard uh, Stockton University in New Jersey. And I am currently um, the assistant director for the Office of Career Advancement at Rowan University in New Jersey. Career, uh, bl uh, Black and Powerful, the career book for t tomorrow's top leaders is an essential uh, book that needs to be in everybody's household who has children. Thank you.
Hello, I am Rahul Amin Quander, one of the authors for this year's Asala program, and I'm just delighted to be the guest of Asala to share with you who I am and what I am here for to tell the story of the Quanders since 1684, an enduring African-American legacy. I am a four-time author. This is my latest book. And this book, The Quandus in 1684, An Enduring African-American Legacy, is not so much a Black history story or African-American history story as it is an American history story. So why is that? Well, your first question might be, well, who are these Quanders anyway? And why is their story somewhat unique or important? Well, very simply, the theme for this year's Black History Month is resistance talking about resistance within the context of the Black struggle. But I've tried to expand it a little bit in my book, even though I didn't know that was going to be the theme for 2023, because I have added two other elements, organization and resilience. So this year, as I am talking to you and talking about the history of the Quanta family, I am adding the strong components of reorganization, resilience, and therefore prosperity. So I will tell that story and let me explain why. Well, our story began in the 1670s, right here in Maryland. Actually, before that, the name Quander is a Fonte name, anglicized from Ghana, West Africa, from the Fonte tribe. So we have records that show that we were actually here mentioned in the 1670s and got our freedom under a will written in 1684, but executed in 1686 when the enslaver died. And in 1686, Henry Kwan Do and his future wife, Margaret Pug, were cast out. Basically, they were turned loose. No education, no jobs, presumably no money, a little bit of personal property, yet they survived. They were cast into an obviously hostile environment because as we know, the environment for blacks in this country in the 1600s was certainly nothing like it is now. There was cruelty everywhere. There was enslavement for the most part everywhere, yet somehow they managed to survive and indeed they prospered over time. Well, how? First of all, they acquired some land in Charles County, Maryland, under a lease for 99 years. Can you imagine that? Then they expanded it up into Prince George's County. And then again, over into Fairfax County, where some of the Quanders who, when they did get their freedom later on, would eventually acquire quite a bit of land in Fairfax County. And one branch of the family, as I relate in the book, was still enslaved. And by happens chance, they were enslaved by George Washington at his Mount Vernon plantation. In fact, that is why the Quanders seem to have such high visibility, not while they were toiling away in Prince George's and Charles County, but because they were enslaved by George Washington. And when they got their freedom, records started showing up, highlighting the Quanta family's sustained presence. Of course, there were other families too. I want to make sure you understand that. So it's important for us to capture that legacy, to share it with as many people as possible, not because we're trying to showcase us, but more because we want to help you help yourself to understand that there is much beyond resistance. There is benefit to organization and reorganization. And importantly, we want to measure all of that in terms of resilience. Now, I talked about the land, but what else did the Quanders and Quando, Q-U-A-N-D-O, a little bit different spelling, what else did they do? Well, they were shopkeepers. They were taxpayers. And consequently, there were things that they had to do that filed records and brought attention to their presence in the counties of Charles County, Prince George's County, and Fairfax County, later in the District of Columbia. So it showed us as entrepreneurs, men and women who are focused about doing something, about being somebody, about getting a little education as much as might have been available to them as Blacks at the time. They worked as carpenters, they worked as laborers, cooks, housekeepers, taking care of children, keeping house clean, 
making sure that the master, whoever that was, or if they were recently freed and being compensated, that whoever the person in whose service they were, they worked to get that done along. And along the way, and over time, they were able to show that their toiling contributed mightily to the creation of this nation. And as I go forth and I lay it out in the book pretty clearly, I underscore that those men and women who some of us may have thought in our minds, oh, they were just a bunch of poor black folk. No, no. These were strong, resilient black folk. And as Maya Angelou would say, and still I rise. They rose from those carpenters, those laborers, those uh, taking care of those nannies, those housekeepers, and they were able to help to hold themselves up. And we need to hold them up too and understand because they built upon that. They built upon that firm foundation to create our presence as Quanders, but your presence too, because all of us have some of that shared background that is part of our African-American, American history legacy that I spoke about a few moments ago. So they went from those levels of cooks and farmers, et cetera. Many became teachers, government workers, mechanics. They drove wagons and carriages because that was a profession. Transport, that profession to transport onto itself. And further on the move, they built and built. More went to college, more got formal education. And from that emerged a group of men and women who became more teachers, principals maybe, some doctors, some lawyers, some IT execs as we get in the 21st century, many of those who became very strong people in many professions. We have a number who were, are in religion, whether it be the Catholic religion, which is the Maryland Quanta Strength, or the Baptist or Methodist religion, which is where the, most of the Virginia group has found itself, has a lot to do with the politics of Maryland and the politics of Virginia. And among those people who were teachers, I mentioned a couple of them. One of them was Nellie Mae Quander. Nellie Mae Quander was not only a 50-year teacher in the DC public schools, she was also the first president of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. Can you imagine that? Funny thing, there's another Nellie Quander, Nellie Brooks Quander. And she became a teacher and a principal in Fairfax County. And uh, along the way, she became the national president of the Association of Elementary School Principals. Can you imagine that? So you see, we were clearly moving along. Now, Quanda family ancestors made their presence in civil rights and in a number of other public area and forums. Let's talk about the military. Quandas participated meaningfully in the Civil War the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan, and don't forget Vietnam. We participated in all of those places with distinction. Still talking about the military, the Quanda family is the only African-American family with four generals. I'm not saying we're not the only family with four generals. It might be, maybe even white families don't have four generals, but we have four generals. And at this time, all four of them are living. And two of those four generals along the way were commandants at West Point. If you don't know what a commandant is, well, that's the number two person at West Point. Uh, General uh, Leo Brooks Jr. was a former commandant and General Mark Quander is the current commandant and General Leo Brooks Jr., his mother was the Quander and his aunt is the same Nellie Brooks Quander that I just mentioned. So indeed, we family has been very much participating in military. We have two Tuskegee Airmen, of course, they've gone to glory now, uh, Donald Victor Quander, who was a top mechanic, top radio man, and who flew the planes as he made repairs on them so that he could make sure that they were flight worthy. And then we also have Charles Johnson Quander, and he was a B-25 bomber. All of these people are on the move. All of these people have made meaningful contributions. And I'm just delighted to be here, to be with you today to talk about that. Now, all of this is codified, if you want to call it that, in a book. This is my fourth book, The Quanders Since 1684, An Enduring African-American Legacy. 
Now, if you're interested in obtaining a copy, you can do so very easily. Just go to our website, quanderquality.com. That's quanderquality.com. And there you'll be able to click on it and get an address, get the price, get the contact telephone number if you need to call me. And I'm available to go out to have book talks, presentations. I've got a number of them lined up for this year's Black History Month. And likewise, I have some things that I'll be doing to promote the Quanda story and history. My wife is a great artist, Carmen Torreya Quanda. She's quite well known. And the painting you see in the background, which you can't see too well in detail, she painted that portrait. And that portrait became this book cover. And this cover is Charles Henry Quander and his wife. <clears throat> and uh, she, unfortunately, is turned to the side in this picture. And um, she is, he rather, uh, on Quanda Road. There are four Quanda Roads in the metropolitan area. And this is Quanda Road in Alexandria. And he's standing there in front of his wagon and she's turning Amanda Rebecca Bell Quanda. She's looking to the side. And he's standing in front of his wagon on Quanda Road. And this photo is based on a photo that was taken in 1915. He died in 1919. We have a very important Quanda family legacy in history, but I always emphasize to all of the people that I talk to when I go out and do book talks on this or the book on Nellie Quanda or any of the other books that I've written, it's not about what the Quandas have done. It's not about what we have achieved. We like to give you the message that is what you and your family and your people can do. And a solace opportunity for me to be with you today in this presentation is to hopefully encourage many of you to go out and learn your family history. It's important to uncover, as we like to say in the Quanda family, to document, protect, preserve, and share. I have a a nonprofit corporation, Quanda Historical and Educational Society. And the purpose of that is just to do that, to document, preserve, protect, and then share. And by sharing, we hope to educate others who can learn more about their own respective family histories and then do likewise. I thank you very much for this opportunity and look forward to meeting some of you out on the hustings as you tell me about your own family histories. Thank you very much, it's my pleasure.
Hi, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you a civil rights icon, Miss Elizabeth Eckford. Would you like to say hello or welcome? Hi, uh, uh, thank you, Eurydice, and uh, Grace is, jo is joining us. All three of us are authors of The Worst First Day, Bullied While um, Desegregating Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, uh, I, I, wrote, I wrote the book because uh, I was hearing um, people changing history here. And, um, and I also wrote the book because I want, uh, everyone to understand that there's something that they can do about bullying. And that is treat other people in the way that you want to be treated. I never ask anybody to defend someone who's being harassed, but uh, simply to treat them uh, humanely. And, and, and that kind of support is extremely important to a person who's being set apart and hated upon. You were 15 years old when you went to Central High. You were about to turn 16. You were a junior. You were the same age Grace was when she helped us write this book. And when, what has it meant to you to have a multi-generational approach with three different perspectives coming into the worst first day? I think that that, uh, that, that that invites a larger audience. And, um, and you know that you pushed me for 20 years to, to write a book and uh, <laughs> finally, um, finally it happened because I, I, I didn't uh, realize it, that, that there would be that enough interest. Because um, uh, even though the, the photograph, the uh, photograph has become iconic, uh, that mob scene photograph, of September 1957, I've had a very ordinary life. So um, I'll tell people that with fame, you can uh, take $10 and your fame and get a cup, cup of coffee. Some places you couldn't even get the coffee. <laughs> so why did you want to go to Central in 1957? Well, I knew that um, even though both my parents worked two jobs to take care of, six kids pay the mortgage and uh, pay the car note that, that they couldn't afford to send me to college. But I had been brought up with my grandfather saying all the time, well, Elizabeth, when you go, would go to college. So um, I, I knew also that the, the most, most important way to change the outcome of one's life is by uh, furthering your education and training. And so I, uh, during segregation, we all knew that uh, white schools had uh, more classes, more courses, uh, more, more laboratories. Uh, at the junior high school where I went, there would be four people standing around waiting for a chance to see in the microscope. So um, I wanted to be as well prepared for college as possible. As a diversity and equal opportunity professional serving in the military, it was a great honor to meet you back in 1999. And I appreciate the opportunity that I've had to listen to you. And that was part of the reason why I asked you so many times to tell your story, because I know how I benefited from it and how much Grace benefited from it. What do you hope readers will take away from reading The Worst First Day? Well, uh, one of the things I want them to understand is that the whole of the civil rights movement has brought about a lot of change, but that change has been incremental. America's march toward equality has, has been uneven and um, that desegregation was a first step. Um, integration didn't even begin here until the 1970s. Wow. So um, uh, I, I want them to see provable history uh, rather than myth-making. You use the term provable history. Why do you use that specific term? Because today some people are asking people to uh, ignore history, um, um, 
to um, create fantasies, and um, we suffer too much to in, to to be, to bear that. Mm -hmm. um, I really believe this has become my mantra that we can never have true reconciliation in America until we honestly acknowledge our painful but shared past. Grace, as a student at Florida and A&M University, a historically black college, actually all of us attended historically black colleges, what has it meant to you to hear from Auntie Elizabeth, as you call her, all of her life, all of your life? To hear from her story? Mm -hmm. To know her story, how has that impacted you in your life? It gives greater meaning to the safe spaces of historically black colleges and universities for African American students and their importance in today and previous generations. It also, especially in months like Black History Month, shows a light on the people who have come before us as current students and given way for us to honor them in ways such as the worst first day by telling their story, telling their stories and making sure that current students know what everything it took to get to where we are now. Thank you. And you 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 touched upon something that's important, honoring, because that has always been very important to me. I, I feel that it is so critical to honor icons like Elizabeth Eckford, as you have traveled for these past five years since we've written the book, Elizabeth, uh, what has your, how have, what have your feelings been when you've met these audiences as they come up to you in tears and they thank you for what you've done across the United States and even in New Zealand? What has the impact been on you? Well, this has been a long journey for me. I started trying to talk about the past in 1997 and what enabled me to continue after a lot of difficulty was the uh, reception that I got from students. Um, I can talk about the past now without crying but uh, it's been a very very uh, difficult journey because initially it was a walk through pain but um, I, I, I feel indebted to uh, students who have um, gone with me on this journey and helped me arrive at this point. And, and can you tell us what's one of your most vivid memories from when you were at Central High? You know, uh, from the very first day when we had a fire drill that was the beginning of the terror campaign. Um, lockers were examined and um, uh, two sticks of dynamite were found. And that was at a time um, when these bomb threats came in. The local police were not prepared for that. Um, we didn't have the ATF in those days. We didn't have bomb sniffing dogs. So the uh, district hired 26 janitors to open every locker every night. Um, I remember that, that I could tell uh, who was part of the organized campaign to uh, try to um, drive us away and who, uh, who the people that were acting independently. Um, but one of, one of my tr most treasured memories is of, uh, my his of my speech class. I was a very, very shy kid, but I look forward to that last class of the day, the speech class where nobody used any uh, uh, hateful uh, language and where two students reached out to me every day just to have an ordinary conversation. And I, it, it, uh, that, that stood out because uh, that was something that didn't happen anywhere else. And uh, I knew that, uh, that this probably uh, presented some difficulty for, for them, but I didn't know until we were reunited 36 years later um, that they didn't realize the impact that they had on me. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you 
reach out to support someone who's being harassed. It helps them know that not everybody hates them. It helps that person to uh, continue. It, it is empowering for that person. I want everybody to understand that. As a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, one of my focuses, of course, is leadership. And the difference in that classroom was the stance that your teacher took. What did she tell the students and what could teachers today learn from her model? Before I came into the class, she told the students the kind of behavior that she would not tolerate. Um, she was one of the few teachers who spoke up. Um, there are some teachers who have admitted to me um, in other places where they are, are aware of people being bullied, but they don't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, bullying can be very, very dam damaging. Uh, my experience um, resulted in 20 years of disability. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody is going to have post-traumatic stress disorder, but it, it is going to be very detrimental to people and, and, and the effects are longstanding. You, you spoke of having PTSD, and I think it was 2014 when you had immersion therapy, and we walked back and forth in front of Central, and, and you kept recounting what happened to you, and that's what your, your doctor told you to do until it didn't hurt anymore. Yes, um, a lot of people... Uh, a lot of people think that the worst that happened was my encountering um, a mob of people who threatened to hang me that day. But um, really, um, we, we were knocked about daily in school. The principals told us that we were to report to the vice principals what happened, but he wouldn't do anything if what we said happened wasn't verified by a teacher and seldom was that happening. We were accompanied in whole ways by soldiers who were our guards. And whether or not they, they uh, reported what they saw depended upon that individual soldier because the general in charge had stationed them in such a way that they couldn't react immediately to the attacks on us. They were too many paces behind. But they could be witnesses and, some, and sometimes they could identify the attackers. Um, but uh, even when people were brought to the office, um, sometimes, um, too often, the principals gave them a talking to and sent them on to class. And that way, uh, people were able to, re same people were able to repeatedly attack us. I learned many decades later that there was an organized group of students who met with an adult after school and plan their attacks for the next day. They brought uh, printed material with hate, with hate messages on them. They, they had coordinated attacks. Um, the, the only thing that, that, uh, that my father saw was the day that he, in January, when we were pelted with rock filled snowballs. But, wow. um, and, and, and we were urged by uh, the head of the NACP to uh, not talk to the press and to uh, de-emphasize the attacks on us to uh, act as though uh, it was working, act, act as though desegregation was working. So um, th there are many people locally who say that they didn't see what happened. They don't believe uh, what happened. And there's even somebody for 65 years has been telling people that what happened to us were pranks. Mm. Trying to knock somebody downstairs st is not a prank. Scalding a person in the shower is not a prank. Um, there were just so many things that happened that uh, often I felt like uh, racial epithets pale in comparison to the uh, uh, battering of us. You endured physical, emotional, verbal, and mental abuse. 
every single day while you were at Central High, would you do it again? No, no. Um, it has been very costly for me. It's been very worthwhile. But um, a lot of the results are, are positive results are due to the court cases that were filed over a long period of time in order to bring about real change because the school district intended limited token desegregation, just a handful of students who were isolated and, and, and they want that to be considered desegregation. As we close, what does it mean to you to be featured on the 2023 Black Resistance poster as a symbol of Black resistance in history? Well, it's unexpected, um, um, but 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 it it, it is um, it's it's. Um, I'm glad that they remember. Um, put have, have a remembrance of people over uh, a long period of time because it also has a Black Lives Matter people on, on mm -hmm. that poster, and it, it is an example of a range of um, of activities, both past and present. Uh, that have been required to, in order to bring about change. It has been an honor to spend time with you as always. And thank you so much for sharing your story, The Worst First Day, Bullied While Desegregating Central High, a six-time award-winning book available on Amazon. Thank you so much. And thank you, Grace, for helping us write this book. Thank you both.